OK, I'll move on to um, the identification. So um, hopefully we'll get this. Can everyone see that? Yeah, that's visible now. OK, let me just start the presentation now. Hold on. You still see that, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> OK, identification of mayfly larvae. So it's a fairly small group, 53, 53 species in the in the UK. Um, and uh, we're really lucky in having some good identification materials. So the Freshwater Biological Association has for many years um, published um, a key to mayfly larvae. The latest version is, is the 2010 version um, by Malcolm Elliott and Uwe Humpesk. Humpesk sorry. Um, and uh, in also in 2010, we, I did a, a with Cyril Bennett. We did a, a pictorial guide to um, mayflies for the Field Studies Council, and the idea of these the, the the FSC guide was not to replace the FBA guide. It was to to make it more accessible to uh, to people, particularly anglers, uh, uh, but other people that are interested in actually finding out more about about mayflies and and trying to trying the identification. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to I'm going to start off with just a little run through of the species that we've got in the UK and then uh, go through the pictorial guide um, and and go through the, the families and uh, highlight how you would identify them. There are I will also bring in some bits from the FBA guide just to highlight um, uh, particular features. I'm not expecting you to be uh, uh, a, an expert in mayflies at the end of this. What I would hope is that you'll be able to identify the main families and then also have an idea about how to go about identifying uh, some of the species. So the first thing to say is that some of the names have changed. Um, in some of the older keys, if you are using an older key, you'll find that uh, some of the names have changed. So, for instance, Amelitis and Opinatus uh, used to be in the Cyphlinuridae, it's now in the Amelitidae, and Arthropleia congena is moved from the Heptogenidae to the Arthropleiidae. Um, so those are those are family changes, but in the species, there's also been a couple of changes. Um, Centroptilum penulatum is now Procleon. Ephemera igniter is Ceratella and Heptagena lateralis is uh, Electrogena. Oh, there's one missing there. Heptagena fuscogrisia is now Cagaronia fuscogrisia. Um, we have also had some additions to the British fauna um, since the so the, the since the the old FBA key was produced. Um, so Canis piscilla was found in the River Y. From and Itchen in 1986. Electrogena affinis was found in the River Derwent in 1988. Uh, Canis pseudorivium in the River Derwent in 1994. Uh, Best, Canis bescadensis in the River Lug in Wales in 1996. And then, so the, all those ones though are in the are in both the keys that I mentioned at the start. The two that aren't in those keys are Betis atlanticus, which was found in various rivers in 2018. And Cyphlinus aestivalis, which was found, has, has since been found in various rivers, and we're just publishing the note on that just now, which will have a key associated with it. But well, I'll go into a little detail on that one later. Um, the FSC guide is, is pictorial. It runs through um, this, just the, the the key to families in it. It runs through and just asks you very simple questions like where are the gills inserted. Um, what what do they look like uh, and so on and that breaks it down into little mini steps that can get you to where where the what family you're looking at I'm not going to go through that just now um, in detail because what I'll do is when we when we go into each family I'll show you the features that are important for that family and we'll start off on that with the Cyphlinuridae um, so this is the this is the the ID chart from the FSC guide, um, which um, 
sets out uh, what what you're looking for. Um, so the Cyphlinuridae they are streamlined nymphs. They've got plate-like gills and they've got little spines on the on the ab on the end of the abdomen. If you can just see here, the, we'll see that in a bit more detail. Um, in in this key, we've 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 lumped Amelitus back in with the Cyphlinuridae because they are very similar and uh, it. Uh, it, it saves just having a single species um, in, a, in a chart. Um, so what we're looking at to identify the Cyphonuridae are the gills and the body markings. So here's Amelitis uh, here, here's the nymph here. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got a dark band on the tails is the first thing to note. Um, and it's quite a broad dark band. The other thing to note with the tails is that they're they're held close together. They, they don't splay out and it's very noticeable when you've got them in the tray compared to say Betis nymphs which they look superficially similar to. Betis nymphs tend to have their 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 tails pointing away from each other whereas these ones are kept really close together. The gills are single um, they're plain, they're, there's just an oval gill plate, um, there's, there's not much detail to them at all. Uh, they, they have these little spines on the end of the abdomen, sometimes easily overlooked. Um, so each abdominal segment's got this little spine, um, particularly visible on this one in the, in the last two here. Um, and then if you really want, if you think you've got one, um, turn it over and have a look at its mouth part. One thing is that the head is really long and it, the head is instead of being up and down the way as you see in, in some nymphs, it's actually it's it's elongated, it's it's um, um, juts out. And if you turn it over, you'll see that the, the mouth parts have got these beautiful orange combs on them um, and they're really distinctive. And sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll be thinking, oh, I've got a bit of weird betis here. You'll turn it over and you'll realise exactly what you've got. Um, Amelitis is the only one with these these combs. Um, so the Cyphlinuridae are are similar similar kind of makeup, if you like, to the uh, to Amelitis. Amelitis. Um, they've got this this dark band on the tails. It's not as prominent as in Amelitis. The gills are um, are different shape. Um, the number of double gills is is key. So in in uh, Cyphlinuridae alternatus, there are six pairs of double gills. In all the other species, there's two pairs, and it's always the first two pairs that are double in those species. You can actually see on this one here, which is Cyphonurus lacustris, um, the, 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 um, the gills are double here, whereas these ones are single. And the gill shape, um, so these are these are lacustris here. In alternatus, you've also got this uh, dark band or dark leading edge to the, the gill. And this is Estevalis, which is the new one. Um, the spines are much more prominent in Cyphlinurus. <coughs> they, uh, they're, they're, they're really quite chunky, as we'll see in a minute. Um, they can have a dark mark on the on the on the sort of like um, flange, if you like, the lateral um, flange of the of the. Uh, body segment so that you see how it's flattened out slightly on either side um, and this can have this dark mark which you can see here and that that's present in Lacustris and in some Estevalis um, but not present in Armatus. Um, I'll show you Cyphonurus alternatus in, in a second and show you its markings. Uh, the other key thing is the, the shape of these spines. So uh, our new species Cyphonurus estivalis um, is very similar to some of the other species, um, but one thing that we we can see um, in Armatus is that when you when you if you take the, sh the line along the 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 um, edge of the the spine, the lines projected from it would cross in the middle of the section that the the spines are on, whereas Nestivalis and in Lacustris, they Cross in this section above, so they're, they're a lot longer. Um, the, in Estevalis, they're a lot longer than they are broad, whereas in Armatus, they're about the same uh, as they are long as they are broad. Um, and the other thing to separate Lacustris from Armatus and Estevalis is on this little um, indentation on the last segment, 
in East, Amatis and East of Alice, there's these two stunking great big spines there, um, which allows you to, which are absent in Lacustris. So putting all this together, you can you can work out what species you've got. I'll just show you two of the other species. Um, Alternatus, as I said, it's got a very distinctive uh, on on the lateral sort of like um, flange flange. I don't know if it's a flange. Um, the lateral um, part of the abdomen, it's it's heavily shaded in in black. And it's got a very dark black band. Um, but dark banding on the tree on on the legs, and that that goes to its name, alternatus. It's alternating patterns, um, and you can see that the gills are have got that strong leading edge, and they're double all the way down there. Um, and this is East of Alice, the, the the new species, um, which you can see it's got very long spines here, um, and uh, it's also got the, you can see the dark band there. Okay, beta day. Um, so the beta day are super superficially similar to the Cyphlinuridae. Um, they're streamlined nymphs. Um, they're very good swimmers. Um, often found in faster water, but you do get some species in standing water. They've got gills down the side of their abdomen. Um, external gills, usually single, um, but there are some with doubles. Um, and what we we look at to get these down into the, the different genera is the tail length and the markings. Um, so here's a, a Betis nymph. Um, like I said, that you've got long tails, long antennae, you've got the gills down the side here, seven pairs, or sometimes six, which we'll come on to. Um, and the first thing we're looking at is the, the tails. So if the middle tail is shorter than the outer tails, then it's Betis. Uh, it's a beta species. If they're round about the same length, they're Centroptilum or Chloeon or Procleon. Um, very simple to do. Sometimes the tail uh, in the betas will have a dark band on it, some won't. Um, the same with the uh, other genera. Uh, the other thing that we're keeping an eye on is the number, the, these sort of the dark rings and where they start and how many, and if there is a dark band on the tail, um, in the FBA key, you'll be asked how many dark rings there are before the dark band um, for some of the species. Uh, head shape and patterning is important as well, particularly in the Betis um, species. So uh, it, we, have, we have two different places for insertion of the antennae. You can see these antennae are, are really widely separated and pointing away from each other. Um, and you see in this one here, same thing. Whereas in this one here, you can see they're much closer together and almost going straight out of the head. Um, so there's, there's a, a cluster of three species, Betis digitatus, Muticus, and Niger, that have these narrow uh, and narrow section between the antennae. Um, in the other ones, uh, Betis scambus is, is fairly readily identifiable by the pattern of marking on its head. It's got these little muscle attachment spots that, that turn out a little pale. You do need to be careful in uh, the further north you go because sometimes uh, these are obscured and the, the whole animal is a bit darker and it just it doesn't quite work as well as it does in the chalk streams. But generally speaking, if you see this, it's beta scambus. Uh, the gills are important. Um, so Betis and Procleon have single gills. Um, and they're they're uh, just a bit like the ones in Amelitus. They're, they're just a single gill plate, very little uh, uh, features to identify anything by. Although we'll, uh, in Betis, Atlanticus and Rodani, they've got these spines down the edge, which can tell you straight away that you've got that species or, or one of those species. In Centroptilum and Chloeon, you've got double gills. Some of the gills are double um, and you need to be quite careful to check and sometimes it's worth taking a gill off to have a look because uh, sometimes the, the the second gill can be quite small this one's quite large but you can get you know uh, maybe half that size but generally speaking they're, they're a different shape to the 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 gills that you would expect to be single you'd expect this the, the single gills to be uh, more oval here's a selection of of betis nymphs um so these are the ones with uh, with the tails the same length, you can see here the tails the same length 
here and here. You see uh, in Centroptilum there's no uh, dark band, whereas in Cloyon Diptrum there, there's a dark band here, uh, and in, in Procleon. Um, this is an absolutely beautiful nymph. I mean, the colouring, the patterning is 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 wonderful, and you can you can spot it a mile off in the tree. Um, the other thing with Chloe and Diptrum is in in a tree, it's it rests in a really unusual or a really distinctive uh, position. It kind of lifts its tail up and curls its its uh, tail end up, and it curls its tails over. So you can actually spot that. Uh, you can spot that in photographs that people send in as well, um, and you're fairly confident that's what you're you're looking at. Uh, the Betis species, just to show you some of them. Uh, so you can see the tail's shorter. Um, this one's got a dark band on it. This one uh, has a dark band on it as well, but these ones don't. Um, sometimes you get a, a almost reverse dark banding on, on Betis Rodani, where you get the tips. As you can see here, slightly darkened and, and the lower bit uh, darkened, but not. it's not a defined dark band. Um, that you're looking for. Um, the Betis muticus and Betis niger are the ones with the, the narrow heads or the narrow bodies. And you can see that they look different, that definitely look uh, quite different. Um, the difference between these two um, species is in Betis muticus, there are seven gills. The, the, you can just see a small gill there. Uh, and then the, the rest down there. In Betis niger and, and Betis digitatus, there's only six pairs of gills. The first gill is always missing, um, which would have been there. And so it's always worth counting back the way rather than counting down the way in case you start at the wrong point. Um, the other thing with Betis niger is that you've got this beautiful pale stripe right away down the animal, um, which is fairly characteristic. Unfortunately, I've got to uh, go on to mouth parts just for a moment, um, because if you really want to confirm your uh, your betis nymphs, you need to look at their, their betidae nymphs, you need to look at their um, mouth parts. It's not the easiest thing to do. Um, you do need a microscope, uh, and it, it's not, some um, many people say it's not for the faint hearted. Um, the, the mouth parts are fairly complex in, in mayflies. They've got um, a pair of mandibles, um, which are covered by the la labrum, uh, and um, there's uh, also a pair of maxilla, which um, have various structures on them. The key features, though, are on the labium um, that we're going to look at, and particularly the labial pulp. And the shape of this pulp is, is uh, useful in determining what genus and sometimes what species you've got particularly in the UK where we don't have many species. So uh, it's more difficult when you get into other other countries where there's lots of species and, and you, you're then counting hairs on the labrum and, and things like that. So here are just some images from a, a, a European key um, which shows the labial palps for betidae that aren't betis. And you see that the, there's different shapes of them and the procleones are um, generally straight edged on the top here um, without any projections. Um, Chloeon has got this projection here. Um, and there's various other features that you would use for that. Um, but, but one thing to notice is that they're all relatively, uh, I'm going to say rectangular, although they're not, but they're relatively straight side sided. Um, uh, when we come onto the beta day, you'll see that there's, they're, they're quite different. You can see, yes, uh, you can see here that the, there's a, a, a notch or a th uh, sometimes called a thumb on the, the this is actually this. There's two segments to the uh, sections to the labial palp. Um, this is the end of the the second segment and that's the third segment. Well, there must be three segments then, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's the this segment is extended out and the, it's the shape of that notch that is the confirmation for for beta scambus and for scatus. Remember, I said that the the markings can be present in for scatus. Uh, you can you if these are obscured, then you can think that you've got it in for scatus. Um, the key, the the definitive thing is looking at the the labial palp. Uh, the same with beta spuceratus and and baroness. Um, beta spuceratus has these four dots on its its body. 
uh, on the upper surface, the dorsal surface of its, its abdomen, which is usually enough to identify it. But if you do want further confirmation, you need to have a look at the the mouth parts. Um, in Vernus, the, the thumb is big and protruding. Um, in the On the mandible, the first tooth of the mandible is, is bigger than the second tooth. And it's also got these little additional spines in in the uh, lower section of the mandible. In Bucerratus, um, the thumb's fairly small. Um, the two teeth are about the same and there's no additional spines. And then to our new species, Atlanticus, um, we're not in the mouth parts now, we're actually at the other end. We're at the, um, the, the two plates, the paraprox that sit underneath the tails. And this, uh, we've looked for everything that we can do to uh, separate these two species and the only thing that we can get is this feature on the paraproct. On Betis atlanticus there's, there are between 12 and 14 spines on, on the edge of the paraproct whereas in Betis rutani there, there are far more up to um, you know over 15. Um, this is a bit fiddly and um, difficult to see but this is the only way to separate those two species at the moment. Um, heptogenidae, we have, um, so heptogenidae are, are the, the flattened nymphs, they're the ones that have uh, the, those broad, that broad head and the flattened body and the flattened legs um, and typically found in fast flowing water. They're really identifiable as a, as a family. The only one that you, you sometimes get a problem with is Rithrogena when it's just about ready to emerge because it comes a bit elongated and it can look a bit cylindrical like one of perhaps one of the the beta day and that's usually Rithrogena semicolorata that you that is the is the problem there the key to uh, identifying to separating the the different genera is the shape of the pronotum and the markings on the leg um which is the most most simple way of looking at them I will talk about Arthropleia congena, um, which we've lumped in here. Uh, it, I've got an image of that to show you just the feature for that. Um, so here's our heptogenidae again, and here are the legs, that, and it's the femur we're looking at. So in Rithrogena, dead easy, it's got this pale area with a dark dot in the middle of it, um, very distinguished, uh, very characteristic, very, very noticeable. In the Ectionus and Heptogenia, the the patterning is is similar. It's got this W sort of shape banding on it. In Heptogenia, it's much more distinct um, than in Ectionus. It's not a great feature, um, but there is a much better feature uh, to separate these two, um, which is in the on the pronotum. You see this extern this this sort of extended side which bulges out and is flattened. Only the Ectionus have that feature and um, none of the other species have that so if you've got a banded leg have a look for that and it'll tell you it's ectionous. And the last one is Electrogena um, which has, I've forgotten Cagaronia again, I'll tell you that about that in a minute, um, Electrogena which has a, a pale sort of cross shape, you can just about make that out there so there's little patches but <coughs> but the, um, the main femur is, is pale. Uh, Cagaronia has a pattern similar to Heptogenia, um, but I'll show you that in a minute, how you get, how you separate them. Um, gill shape can be important as well. Uh, we have uh, not, in these in these larvae, they've got a, a gill plate um, here and a, a tuft of filaments. And the, the relative size and, and shape of the gill plate and the filaments is important. So in this one here, you can see the filaments uh, are, are down here and the gill plate is, is oval. Um, this is this one here. Um, in Cagaronia, it's got these really pointed gills and the really bushy um, filament, very distinctive when you see it. And then in, in others, um, the, gill, the filament can be bigger than the, the gill plate. As I mentioned there, the, the pronotum I mentioned earlier. Here's some images of those species. So this Cagaronia with its very pointed gill um, uh, there. It's also got, you can see the banding there is a bit weaker. It's a bit, whilst it's W's, it's 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 thinner. And um, it actually, in the adult, it's, this this mark here comes through in the adult as well as a, a sort of like armband effect. 
So you can see the uh, the cross shape in Electrogena there, um, and in Ruthogena the the marking there on the the um, uh, FEMA, and the 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 very definite marking on Heterogenea sulfurea, and it's got this banding on the legs and on the the tails, which is quite distinctive. Um, Ectionus nymphs uh, larvae cause people headaches. Um, they they they're fairly difficult to do. The the key is to have lots of them. Um, you know, trying to identify a single larvae is is difficult. Um, the the best thing is to be able to have a lot in a tree and say, well, those are different to those ones, and then that helps you to separate them out. Some of the tips are that you know, Ectionus in sickness is really easy to identify because it's got this. Uh, markings on the underside on the ventral surface, these lines and dots. Um, the other ones, um, you're looking at the, the shape and side of the pronotum. So um, in Ectionus dispar, it's a relatively short and and pretty rounded um, extension on the side, whereas in uh, other species, it's it's longer. It comes out longer. That's fairly subjective and not not the easiest to to find. You can look at the the tarsi, the the feet, and whether they've got um, two bands, one at either end, or just the one band at the the far end, and that separates out the species those into two groups of species. And um, the other thing is that with mature specimens, only with mature specimens, you can turn them over and have a look at the patterning on the underside. And Ectionus terentis has a sort of inverse insignus pattern. It's got these dark patches with white, uh, with, with pale markings on it. And in dispar, it's got a leading edge to the segment, which is dark. Um, that only works in mature specimens um, could, because that's the only time that, that those are present. So there's a bit of there's a bit of a combination to go in there. There are other features in the FBA key, which includes the mouth parts, but they're re again, they're really subjective. If you've got a lot of specimens, you can use them, but uh, individual specimens, it's, it's pretty difficult. Uh, and the same with Ristid genus Semicolata and Germanica. So these are, the, these are actually out of the FBA key, and you can see that, yeah, you can just about see differences in some of these, but they're pretty subjective. It, they're, all, they're okay in a, a line drawing, but when you see in individual specimen with these features, it's not all that easy to tell them apart. And, and to be honest, most ecologists will lump them together into just a, a species group because it's just not uh, reliable enough. One thing, there's two things though, that it, because if you've got mature nymphs, you know, with those big dark um, uh, wing pads in say March, April, May, um, they're going to be Rithogena germanica because they're, maybe not May, actually March or April, they're going to be Rithogena germanica because they're they're ready to emerge. Um, whereas if you've got them at other times of the year, they're probably going to be Rithogena semicolorata. Um, the other point, which is kind of, uh, we need a lot more work to, to confirm, but the, there does seem to be a bit of a sh difference in shape in that, that spot on the femur. So in semicolorata, it, it seems to be much more defined and much more circular, whereas in Rithrogena germanica, it seems to be a bit more of a streak. Um, you can see the difference there. See what I'm trying to say, um, but we need to look at a lot more, a lot more legs. And here's the two species that uh, uh, that actually um, classed as extinct in the UK, um, but they come in this family. So, there's Heptogenia longicorda, which looks uh, a bit like the other Heptogenia, Heptogenia sulfurea um, or, or Cagaronia. Um, but on the pronotum, if you look at them side on, it's got these two bumps on the pronotum, um, which the other ones are just smooth. And then Arthropleia congena, it's only been recorded in the UK once, um, but it's definitely that species. So uh, it might still be out there, but it's got these, the maxillary palps are, are huge. They're, they're adapted as a, a as a basket and they've got these hairs along them. I can't see that having been, you know, unless it's not been sampled where it lives, I can't see it uh, being overlooked by anybody. So 
So I hold out hope that we're going to we're also developing some eDNA techniques to try and sample some of the sites that it might occur in um, to try and rediscover these species. <coughs> uh, the canidae, um, these are these are tiny. Um, that, that's the, the key point on these, they, they're rarely over what five millimeters, um, maybe slightly bigger in Brachycercus. Um, they're they're small. The the gills, um, instead of being external and, and visible, they're actually tucked away underneath a little skirt um, formed out of the the second gill. Um, is actually expanded into a, a gill cover, and that's because they live in silt and they they need to protect their gills from getting silt on them. And we used the pronotum shape initially to separate the species. So this is this is the this is the nymph here. You can see the gill cover. There's the first gill there. And this is actually the second gill is is here. Uh, it's been modified into a big cover, and then underneath there are all the other gills. We use pronotum. Well, we, we use the feature on the head and the pronotum to separate the species. First one is Brachycercus, um, and Brachycercus has these horns on it. You can see them one there, one there, and there should be one right about there. Um, and these these instantly tell you you've got Brachycercus. It's a pretty. It's the biggest canidae we've got in in the UK. It's, it's about nine millimeters, I think. So it's it's uh, it's it's pretty chunky for a canis. Um, uh, and it's got a fairly limited distribution um, it's in some of the chalk streams. It's in the Derwent. Um, there is there are occasional records elsewhere as well. The other feature is the pronotum. So if we look at Brachycercus, you can see the pronotum just is fairly normal um, for a nymph, for a larvae, sorry. Um, whereas in the other ones, they've got these outwardly projected um, edges. Well, these these edges that are, are formed into a shape. Um, so in Canis horaria, you can see it's it's uh, they're expanding from the back to the front, so that you've almost got a, a, a concave edge there. In robusta, there's a right angle at the end of it, um, and it's very robust. Um, surprisingly, uh, in other species, they they tend to have a convex. Uh, edge so they they round they, they may come out but they'll round back in towards the head um so that th that's the first point that you're looking for in the the cane canidae um then you'll be looking turning them upside down having a look under the, the last segment to separate out canis luctuosa macrura which has a a deep dent a deep indentation in the last segment underneath Whereas in the other ones, they don't. They sometimes have a little dip, but never that deep sort of like V-shaped indentation. Ephemeralidae, nice and simple. There's two species um, and we use the body markings to separate the species. Um, these these nymphs have their gills on the back um, of their, their abdomen and they're, they're, they consist of a plate and a, a pair of, uh, and some filaments. Um, the filaments are sort of like lamellae, so they're they're not like thin. They're they're sort of like plates. They're small plates. Um, the uh, the the shape of the gill and the patterning is used in the FBA key, but actually, when you when you look at the nymphs, if you if you step back and have a look at them, you can see that the the serratella uh, has banded tails, banded legs, and it's got these really prominent spines on each um, abdominal segment. Whereas in um, ephemeral and notata, uh, it's the, the main feature. It doesn't have those features. It's got these longitudinal, two longitudinal stripes down it, which are really quite distinctive. You can mix these up as as uh, when they're very, very small, but they tend to occur at different times of the year. Well, they used to occur at different times of the year. It's certainly in the south of England. They may occur at the same time now. The ephemeridae, um, three species, and it's all about the body markings again. Um, the, the, it's shown there, but I will show you on the next slide as well. But the, in ephemera vulgata, these big defined triangular marks on the body, and it goes all the way up the body. Um, in ephemera lineata, it's a set of lines. Um, and then in ephemera danica, it's um, these sort of like less distinct sausage shaped sort of uh, 
uh, markings. Sometimes, if you've got a dark specimen of lineata, you you can get you can get confused between these two. Um, you you rarely get confused with Bulgata because it is a, a very defined body. Uh, you know the pattern's really defined. So there's Ephemera danica. You can see these markings here. Uh, and that's just the same, the, the markings just shown there. The, the nymphs are, are really, um, they're, they're adapted to um, live under, in the gravels. So they dig a chamber in the gravels, a U-shaped chamber in the gravels, which they lie in. And their gills are actually over the back of their body. You can see here, this, these ones here, they would normally lie across the back of the body. And they, they use these gills to push water through that, that chamber. But they're adapted to have big digging legs here at the front. They've got these tusks for moving the material out of the way as well. Leptophlebidae, um, nearly at the last family here. Leptophlebidae are um, a, this um, what six species. Um, the the best the, they've got these really distinctive um, tails which are held at right angles to each other. Um, and the gills are really distinctive, and it's the gills that we'll use initially to separate out the, the species, but then we'll also have to look at uh, the, the claws. So we've got, this is a um, paraleptophlebia. Um, you can see it's got these tuning fork gills here, um, and you can see the tails out at right angles to each other. Apart from that, they look a bit like a, a betis um, nymph. Um, sometimes, I mean, the gills on leptophlebidae are, are, are optional in many cases they, they fall off when you look at them um so you know you if you if you are looking for leptophlebidae don't just bung them in with everything else bung them in separate tubes so that you, if the gills fall off you you know which one it came from um the shape of the gills is important um so in the leptophlebidae in the leptophlebia uh the gill expands out into a plate Whereas in paraleptophlebia, it stays as this sort of like thin strap like. And in habrophlebia, you've got a, a multi fingered sort of uh, a gill, sort of multi filament, filament gill. It's a bit like a, a branch of a tree. <coughs> um, and it's got two branches. Each of these have got two branches. So the, um, you've got the two branches on the, on the paraleptophlebia and the two plates on the uh, uh, leptophlebia and the two branches here. Uh, Leptophlebia marginata and Vespertina is separated by the shape of the gill predominantly. Um, in, in mature specimens, you can see this. Um, it uh, stops fairly abruptly and tapers. There's a long, thin end filament uh, in marginata, whereas it, it, it's much more, uh, much less abrupt in Vespertina. Uh, the one thing to note, though, is that all the leptophlebia start off looking like paraleptophlebia. So you've got to be careful that you are looking at the right genus. Um, and there are uh, a number of uh, records that I've received that are of weird things that are actually probably leptophlebia marginata, but they've just been looking at very small nymphs. Oops. Uh, one of the things we can do to help with this is to look at the, the, the tarsal claw um, and the various length of that uh, tarsal claw, uh, the, the teeth, sorry, on the tarsal claw. So you can see here, um, this is halfway along, uh, whereas this is two thirds along, and then various ones here. I'll just show you some of these just now. And um, the other thing we can do is we can go back to the mouth parts. In paraleptophlebia, the uh, maxillary palp is much longer than the maxilla. Um, and you know, you, you, just the first segment is longer than the maxilla, and it's got all these fine hairs at the end. Whereas in leptophlebia, the first segment doesn't reach the end of the, the maxilla. And just for, for completeness, there's habrophlebia there as well. Uh, here's the two, well, here, here's the main ones. I've left off habrophlebia because it's distinctive from its, uh, its gills. But you can see here that the gills stopping abruptly in marginata, um, the teeth only covering about two thirds of the the, the claw length, um, whereas in Vespertina the gills taper off to the end and the teeth cover most of the, the claw length. 
The other thing is that if you've got a really high powered microscope, you can actually see that on the edge of the femur, the the, the spines on the edge of the femur in Lecti flavia marginata are, are plain and just pointed, whereas in Vespertina they're like little Christmas trees. And you can do the same thing with um, sub uh, with Paralecta plebia. So in um, in submarginata and cincta, the, the um, teeth stop about halfway along, whereas in Werneri they go to about two thirds. And this is where the problem is that this Werneri is really quite rare. Um, but if you were looking at a, a juvenile specimen of Lecta plebia marginata where the gills hadn't expanded yet and it looked like it had those strap-like gills, then you looked at the claw, you would say, all right, two thirds of the way along. Well, it must be paralepta flavia wernery, and it's not. Um, so, and so the other, you've got to look at the mouth parts to separate these two. And finally, um, the final one is potamanthidae. Now, there's only one species of potamanthidae in the UK. It's called Potamanthus luteus. It's found in the river. Well, it used to be found in the river Thames, Seven, uh, Thames, Usk, and Wye. Uh, it's been lost from the Thames. Um, it occurs occasionally on the Usk, but it hasn't uh, established a population there again yet. Um, and it's it's declining on the Y. But it's since been found in the Severn, and it's doing incredibly well in the Severn. If you want to see Potamanthidae, um, go to Shrewsbury in the in the sort of like late summer, and there, there's hatches of them. It's, it's quite remarkable. Um, it's a really really pretty uh, larva. It's got these banded legs. It's got these m beautiful markings down the side and these really delicate gills. And the gills look a bit like the ones on the uh, on the ephemera species, but instead of being held over the body, they're held out to the side. And this again is living in little pockets of uh, sand and gravel in, in the river. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and emerges in, in sort of like from about July. It comes to light, so if you're running a light trap, you'll get these in the light trap. And that's one of the ways that we first discovered that it was on the, the seven. We've got records of it from, from light traps. Okay, so that's again another whistle stop tour through identification. Um happy to answer some questions now because I'm sure there will be some. I'll stop sharing the screen. Thanks very, Thanks much, very much. much. You said it was a whistle stop tour, tour, but I feel like it's incredibly in depth. It's quite, it's quite a subject to, to cover in, in a short space of time. Yeah, it's what I was saying that, you know, and it's trying to give you enough that you can go back and watch the video to see the, the points. Uh, but, uh, you know, you're not going to come away from this being able to identify everything, but it gives you the point as to where you can identify things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also that's worth highlighting again, again to everybody that's listening in. They will have the opportunity to look back over this video. Hopefully, well, I, I would say by next week we'll have it posted onto YouTube. So, so you should be able to watch back and refresh your memory about anything that Craig mentioned that um, you perhaps didn't pick up on the first time. Um, so, just scrolling back through the meeting chat, Craig. Um, there were a few questions came out while you were talking through the first section that I think the people that made some of these comments initially, um, will these features be present in all instars? Nettie was referring to, I think, the first family that you were, you talked about, um, the first family of larvae that you were talking about. So uh, generally speaking, the keys are all, all, all the keys for mayflies uh, are designed to be used with mature larvae, but some of the, but you can use the features in in some of the earlier instars. I mean, a good example is that last, you know, the second last one that we're talking about, Leptoflevidae. That, you know, if you if you, you if you've got a mature larva, you can it's no problem. There's, you're not going to get it confused. But if you've got a, an early instar. You're going to get confused, and in the FBA key, and I think in the FSC key, it does mention when you should be looking at. So I think in in Leptoflevidae, it says something about maybe over five millimeters um, for for getting these features. <coughs> that so it depends, Nettie. 
the the next question that Steve asked um, has genetics been used to identify and classify species if not will it be in the future or rather just morphological features and you did make mention later on about um, environmental DNA eDNA being used to try and determine presence or absence of a particular species is um, is there any any more so, that you'd like to add to that yeah so um, we we've we well once the Natural History Museum lab reopens, we'll have barcodes for DNA barcodes for all British uh, mayflies species. Um, the, the, the discovery of Betis Atlanticus in the UK was as a result of a, a, a previous survey that was looking at the, the, the gen genetic variation in Betis across Europe. And they came up with a, a, a haplotype that um, they were looking at haplotypes and they were looking at which ones were where and subsequently somebody else um, linked the this one particular haplotype with Betis Atlanticus and then it was like well wait a minute that haplotype's in the UK so let's go and look for Betis Atlanticus and we found it and um, so yes that's been used and then the Cyphlinurus Aestivalis one we confirmed with uh, DNA barcoding so we got specimens and we, we checked them against other specimens that have been done to confirm that what we had was Cyphlinurus estivalis. Um, the eDNA, the idea is that we should be able to go out and look in streams uh, for species to find out their, their distribution by... Uh, um, we, we, there's been a lot of talk in the in the in the, the media about these lateral flow tests for, for COVID. Well, it's exactly the same technique that we're, we're using for for um, eDNA surveys. You know that you'll be able to put a spot of water on this and it'll tell you if the species is there. And that's the ultimate aim. At the moment, we've got to take, we've got to filter the water and then take it away back to the lab to to uh, sequence. Um, but yeah, in, in the fullness of time, you can you can do it for some species already, this uh, um, lateral flow test. They, they do it for detecting um, for wildlife crime detection, you know, um, so, uh, ivory and, and various other things in, in um, Africa. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, uh, given the wide geographical range of some mayfly species, have any developed subspecies to live in varied habitats? Yes, but not in the UK. I think that'd be the answer to that. That subspecies is an interesting thing because it, just because a species lives in a different habitat doesn't necessarily mean it's a different subspecies. The 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 species concept is all about whether they can reproduce together. Um, so a subspecies doesn't necessarily a subspecies maybe a, a a point on the way to becoming a species, um, but not necessarily. And we don't have any subspecies in the mayflies in the UK. We do in the stoneflies. Um, but yeah, no, none in the, none in the mayflies. OK, thank you. Um, Kenny has asked, is there any of it? Can, can you see the meeting chat, Craig? Just, I can, yeah. You, you are OK. Um, uh, Kenny's asked me this before, is there any evidence of hybridization of Rodani and Atlanticus? And not that we know, um, we don't actually, uh, uh, we're still gathering information on the distribution of Atlanticus. There does seem to be, uh, uh, and I'm going to get this, I can't remember the, the right way around this is, but there does seem to be a bit of a, a habitat difference between them. So one is living in the main stem of the river and the other is living in, in smaller uh, tributaries. I can't remember which way around that is, but there does seem to be that. What we need to do is a lot more recording in an area that has both to find out what's going on. Hopefully they'll manage to get a student to do that at some point. Um, next one, with the species difference being so marginal in many cases, is there much interbreeding? Um, the, the species differences are, are marginal, but we're only in this workshop we're only looking at the the larvae and in some 
you know, in some, if you look at the uh, ectionerus, um, they're they're difficult to separate. But if you were to get the adults, they, particularly the submagos, they look completely different, and the the genitalia of them look completely different. So it's only in this stage that it's difficult. Um, and, and in conversely, if you were look at uh, betas, female betas imagos, you can't separate most of them, in fact, all of them. Um, so you know, but you can in the in the larval stage. So it, it, it's a. I don't. Whilst the the differences may seem subtle to us, I think they're fairly major to the individual, the animal itself. So any research being carried out on? Do they have? To, uh, well, that's what I was just just saying there that we we need to do that. Um, there is a suggestion that one of them is in bigger rivers than the other. Um, uh, emergence patterns. Again, we don't have much information on it at all. Bates Atlanticus um, is a fairly new species, uh, but it has been found all, ar all around the Atlantic coast of Europe. Um, it's, it's one that we just need to do a lot more work on. Oh, Hugh asking, Betis or Alanites vermuticus? Who knows? Um, so, the names, the, the generic names for uh, mayflies flip flop between uh, what's used in Europe, what's used in the rest of the world, and what's used in the UK. For long enough, we were all betas uh, in the UK, in the UK, and then there was a a move to have everything uh, split up into lots of different uh, genera, like Alanites and Labiobetus and Nigrobetus. Uh, uh, that's kind of been reversed, but then I noticed now that the new European checklist is now suggesting that they should be back in, uh, or, the, or the developing European checklist is, is suggesting they should be back in. Um, I've kept them all as betas um, just because it, it helps us, uh, and, and, and left Alanites as a, as a sub genus um, at the moment because it just helps that continuity with other with our our previous keys and so on. Which catchment says Siphonius Estevelis been found in, please? Oh, you have to read the paper, Nick. Um, it's coming out soon. Uh, no, it's been it's been found fairly widespread. Um, so it was first we were first alerted to it being here when uh, an ecologist from the Netherlands was on holiday in Scotland, walking the East Highland Way, and he collected some Siphonius from a pool. Uh, and got home and realised that they were, well, he, he, lots of lacustrous, but also a couple of Estevalis. Unfortunately, he didn't have a good reference for that pool, um, so we don't know exactly where on that 132 kilometre walk they are, but I'm going to have to do that at some point now. Um, but we that, that made us start thinking and started us looking, and we found it in uh, Sussex and... Oh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head now. Definitely found it in Sussex and somewhere else um, since. We've gone back and looked at other specimens in the museums and we found it within there. So it's been a, it's been in the country since the 1970s at least. You know, the, the earliest record we've got. Um, it is most of the armatus that we've had are actually Estevelis. Um, which means that Armatus is actually only now present in one site that we know of in the UK. Um, I think Estevelis will turn up elsewhere as well in amongst populations of Lacustris. So keep an eye out for it. The paper will be out by the end of the month, I think. It lives in, it tends to live in, uh, in uh, it seems to live in places that dry out. Um, so it's it's in reservoirs that are drawing down, particularly we we found. Well, there's one in the Pennines. There's one at, I think the one at um, uh, Bow Chief Fish Ponds, at Bow Chief Abbey, has got Estevalis. That's another site. What makes these mayflies different from continents to continent, or rather, no, we find we find species across the world. I mean, Chloeon diptrum is colonised all the continents apart from Antarctica. Um, we have uh, Amelitis is found in Canada as well as in 
the you know it's a high high latitude species um uh, we find species common species in in asia not so many in asia actually or in in, in australasia um it tends to be that we, if we have any that are in common it'll be with um the northern parts of the united states and canada do you know uh, do you know what proportion of the world's species of mayflies occur in the uk uh, 53 divided by 3200 3,200, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do the math. Yeah. Do the math. <laughs> uh, nice to see some mayfly wiggles. Uh, yeah, Claire, I know what you mean. Uh, if there are no gills are present, can you set with paralectophlebia from habrophlebia? Yes, use the mouth parts. Um, although I th you usually end up with at least one gill. Single, singular. Um, but yeah, use the mouth parts because the paralectophlebia has got this massively long uh, maxillary palp and habophlebia, it's it's l long, but it doesn't, it's nowhere near as long. It's not in the FBA key, that feature though, so uh, get in touch, Glenn, and I'll send you that slide or you can get, you just grab it off the video when it comes out. <coughs> RID features the same for males and females. Are the sexes differentiated in larvae? Um, they are the same for males and females in the larvae, uh, and in the later instars you can sex the larvae. So once you've got to, you know, once the, the wing pads are developing, you start to see the, the forceps of the male developing, these little hooks at the end of the body. Um, so uh, we, yeah, so you, you would be able, you would be able to sex them at the very end. Okay. Um, Yeah, Andrew just saying about Easter Vallis. Uh, we have a huge population of signal crayfish in the Derbyshire Derwent. Yes, um, yes, there is an impact. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Kate Meiders, is it? Uh, the, 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 there's a couple of papers that show the impact of crayfish on um, in other aquatic invertebrates. If you want to get in touch, Simon, um, I can send you those papers. Is there, a, is there a list of which pollutants affect which species that can be used to track? Uh, not a list of pollutants, but you can use uh, aquatic invertebrates to create, a, to, to calculate a, a whole range of different metrics, uh, bio, bio, biotic indices. So you can do things for, um, you can do things for uh, general pollution. Uh, for like organic pollution, you can um, use it for the amount of sediment in the stream, the 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 amount of fl the the flow characteristics of the stream. Um, there's there's other ones for acid waters. Um, you know how acidic the water is. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head what the other ones are. Um, there's you, there is one for for phosphates, although it doesn't really work for the whole of the UK. There's one for pesticides uh, as well so you, yeah it's not so much a list of pollutants but you can use these species to identify where there may be those pollutants may be best time of year for looking for id uh looking for um you can look for them any time you'll get different species at different times of year i mean the best time of year is probably uh april um, if I was doing if I was doing this workshop in the flesh in real life, well, I am in real life, but you know what I mean. If it, face to face, I I would try and aim it for April because that's when you're going to get um, mature. You, most things and most things are starting to develop. Then M May is good as well. Um, once you get past June, July, you start. Some species will be in the egg stage for the next year. They'll have laid their eggs already, um, but probably probably May. April, May um, would be the best time. How do mayflies take in oxygen once the gills have gone? Um, so the gills fall off. Uh, so so the, well, the gills are the two things. I mean, the gills are OK once they're uh, the, gill, the gills. Mostly it's when you preserve the specimens that the gills fall off, uh, but 
you they can be damaged in kick sampling or in in events in the the stream and that they typically don't lose all their gills at once so they just do still have um uh, some gills where they can take an oxygen but they also take an oxygen through the the body cuticle as well and um, the gills are just the, the, the added bonus on top um so it's it's not um and and sometimes the gills aren't uh, some gills are more efficient than others and, and required more than others. So, for instance, the um, the ones that are living in in slower flowing, less oxygenated waters will have, probably have bigger gills because they need they're using them to take in more oxygen. Whereas the ones that are in fast flowing, really oxygenated waters probably aren't taking much oxygen in, into the gills at all. I think John's just. Um, <coughs> added to that, once pupated, how do they take in oxygen once pupated? Well, mayflies don't pupate, so I think what you what you're meaning is once they've become an adult. Not not I sure. Think, I, I think so. Yeah, I think that's maybe what he's getting at. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, they are in the same way as other insects. I don't think they've got spiracles though. Um, it'll be through the body integument and yeah I don't know actually it's a good, good question um, any more I think that's all the questions um, you already answered Steve's question that Andrew was interested in the answer okay. to um, so yeah I, unless anybody else has any more questions I uh, Craig thank you so much uh, well, I've, like, got, I've, I've got one last presentation on recording, if that's okay. Just a very short one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. So I'll move on to that just now. Hold on.